So join me this morning by turning to 1 Samuel chapter 16 as we open God's Word and we study it together this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 16. You will find that on page 1022 of the church Bibles on the chairs in front of you. If you need to borrow one of those, please choose to do so and study God's Word with us today. This is week two of our new series that we've just begun. It is over the life of David, and we have titled the name of this series, Shepherd, Hero, and King. And again, as I said, we are in 1 Samuel 16 once again today. In the Oxford English Dictionary, it defines the word resume as a brief account of one's professional or work experience and qualifications, typically sent with a job application. Perhaps you have heard about the person who was interviewing for a new managerial position and on their resume they had written under the strengths section that their strengths were this. They said, my department has turned a profit every quarter for the past five years. I've never had a personnel problem ever. And then they wrote, I've always gotten superior performance reviews. But then immediately under that, under the weakness section, they wrote their number one weakness is I tend to exaggerate and to bend the truth. (laughs) Kind of cancels it out, doesn't it? But seriously, a resume shows through past experiences one's qualifications for future endeavors. I want to say that again. A resume shows through past experiences one's qualifications for future endeavors endeavors. And in a spiritual sense, we are all putting together our resumes right now for what God has planned for us in the future. None of us, not a single one, knows exactly what it is that God has planned for us in our tomorrows. But there is no question that the way that we handle the experiences and the tasks that we're faced with today will either prove us or they will disqualify us for future roles in his perfect plan. So what we're going to see beginning in our text this week is somewhat of a tale of two kings. Right off the bat, we are going to see a contrast that is made between King Saul and the freshly anointed future but unknown King David. To put it into perspective, if we were talking about the stock market this morning, the value of Saul is showing signs of rapid decline, while the forecasted market value of David is rising to unprecedented highs. And this morning we're going to see what makes the difference between these two men. Beginning in verse 13, I want to read down through the remainder of the chapter, down to, through verse 23, so follow along as we read God's word. Verse 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand, and Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Our passage picks up 
right after God had sent his prophet Samuel to anoint David with oil, which we looked at last week, and that symbolized the fact that he was God's choice to be the next king, David was. And then we're told immediately here in the text that after that happened, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forth. And it is by no coincidence that in the verse following that, in verse 14, we're told this, that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now these two verses are placed within Scripture intentionally back to back to cast a vivid contrast before us. Now understand that this is not to tell us that, or it's not implying that the Spirit of God and His presence is, is limited, and it could only be upon David, or it could only be upon Saul, but it couldn't be upon both of them at the same time. That's not the purpose of this contrast. We know that the Spirit of God is equal to, the, the, to God the Father in the sense that, they, that He is omnipresent. He is not limited in His space or by time. But instead, what this is intended to do is to be a vivid contrast to show us of what happens when a man rejects God and then God consequently rejects that man. And when a man accepts God, therefore God accepts that man. That's the contrast that we see here between David and Saul. The presence of the Spirit and the removal of the Spirit. Samuel had previously told Saul, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Since Saul had decided to follow his own ways, since Saul had decided to build himself a kingdom rather than running the kingdom the way God would have him to run it. And he's rejected God's ways by going his own way, and therefore this, what we see here today, is the consequence of that choice. Here's a key lesson for us to learn today, if we haven't learned this already in our lives. Our disobedience, our rebellion, our sins, our failures, our shortcomings will not thwart the plan of God. But they will alter our role in the fulfillment of that plan. One way or another, God is going to use you. One way or another, God is going to use me to accomplish his will. If Saul had been obedient to the Lord and not disobedient, and if he would have followed his instructions, we're led to believe that he could have been used to bring glory to God in a positive and in a productive way. I remind you of Samuel's words that I shared with you last Sunday, back in chapter 13, after, um, after he had grown impatient with Samuel, and Samuel hadn't showed up, and he was ready to take the men out to battle, and, and he took it upon himself to do something that the king of Israel was not allowed to do, and he decided to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, which was reserved only for the priests of God. He was going clearly against God's commands. This was defiance, and he took it upon himself to do something that he was not qualified to do. And in that moment, Samuel came to Saul and he said, Thou hast done foolishly, because thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. What he's saying there is, had you been obedient and done what you were supposed to do, listen, God would have kept you the, the throne in, in your family for generation after generation after generation. But because of his rejection of God's plan and going on his own plan, Verse 14 says this, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. Because of his rebellions and resistance to the Spirit of God, the Lord will use Saul now to accomplish his will through the judgment of his foolish choices, which sets David up to be next in line as king so that he's going to be used of God in order to accomplish his plan for a king. But here's the deal. Saul is not out of the picture now of being used by God for his plan. His role has just changed. Before he had the blessings of God working in his favor, now God's going to use him in judgment. So we get a behind-the-scenes look this morning at how God is going to work this out and how he's going to do this in these verses that we've read. We're told that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David as he departs from Saul. 
Now, it's important that we understand the workings of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the working of the Holy Spirit in, to, in the New Testament. It's the same Spirit, but His working is different now in the New Testament believer. Ever since the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down and empowered the church after Jesus' ascension back into heaven, you remember Jesus had said at that time, He had said to His disciples in John 16, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And that title, Comforter, which is parakletos in the Greek, that word Comforter is referring to the Holy Spirit. And so ever since the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God now has come down and he dwells within every single believer who has put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. He indwells every believer. And he can never leave, and he will never depart the Christian. Now, sure, there are ways that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And there are ways that we can uh, quench the Spirit in our lives. But we, we, we need not ever fear that we will be separated from the Spirit. We ought never need to fear that he's going to depart from us if we're believers in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 5 reminds us, For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. The Holy Spirit of God is God's eternal presence with us, or God's uh, uh, ever presence within us as believers. Though we may resist Him at times, we'll never be without the Holy Spirit living within us. He is our earnest, the Bible says. He's our down payment. He is our guarantee, our surety of a future and eternal inheritance that we have from God in Christ Jesus. That's what He is within us. We are marked by him. We're sealed by him, Ephesians 1.3 talks about. We're sealed by him. The, the, the presence of holy God is, um, being within us signifies that we are God's. You can say that the Spirit of God is his signature in our lives. Signing on the dotted line, we are his possession. That's the New Testament. However, back here in the Old Testament era, the Holy Spirit did not dwell permanently within those who were believing in, who were believers and followers uh, of God. He didn't dwell within the individual. But rather what would happen is that at times the spirit of God would come upon certain people and he would fill them with great power. He would fill them with knowledge to be able to do whatever it was that God had called them to do, marvelous things whether it be mighty works of valor or in military feats or supernatural words of prophecy that they would speak, but regardless, it was not a one it was not a sign of one's salvation when the spirit came upon them. And it was never a permanent thing. It was always temporary in the Old Testament. Simply put, we could say this, the spirit of God equipped and strengthened Old Testament saints to do the thing that God had called them to do. And so what I'm trying to point out here with Saul, the fact that the Spirit is said to have departed from him, listen, this is not in, in, uh, implying or indicating that he has lost his salvation. That's not what this is, that what, it's not what this is all about. But he has certainly lost something, and we're going to see that. You know, for Saul, after he himself had been anointed by Samuel, early on in 1 Samuel, we're told that at that time the Spirit of God had come upon him as well, just as it's come upon David, and there was a noticeable change in Saul's life at that time. Whereas before, he was filled with skepticism and insecurities. He questioned Samuel's words to him that he was chosen to be the, next, or to be the first king of Israel. It was hard for him to believe. He, he even was found hiding amongst the stuff, according to 1 Samuel 10. Literally, the stuff, whatever that is. But he was hiding on the day in which he was supposed to be introduced to all the tribes of Israel as the, as the king of Israel. And what's he doing? He's so nervous. He's so scared. He's hiding from them. But you know what? When the Ammonites threatened the people of Jabesh Gilead, we're told that the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And in that moment, he was changed. And he rallied together, he gathered together some soldiers and formed an army and he led them out to battle against the Ammonites and he defeated the enemies and protected the people of Israel. He had courage, he had strength because he had the Spirit of God upon him. He's lost something all right now that the Spirit of God has departed from him. Because from now on, now that the Spirit is no longer in or upon, the, uh, upon king, uh, Saul as king, 
he will be without this empowering presence of the Holy Spirit to not only give him power, but also to lead him and guide him with all wisdom and insight. His reign as king from this point on will be purely run by his fleshly instincts and his limited understanding. And any spiritual gift, whether it's a gift of governing or wisdom to be able to rule in civil matters, any spiritual gift of courage or strength that may have been bestowed upon him by the Holy Spirit, it's all left Saul now that the Spirit has left. Friends, that's a scary thing, especially whenever we consider our leaders. He's running basically on cruise control based on Saul's limited understanding. And because of his disobedience, because of his unrepentance, Saul fell out of favor with God. And ultimately, he's going to fall out of favor with the people too. Contrast that with what we see taking place with David in these upcoming chapters. Verse 5 of chapter 18 tells us that David was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Verse 16 says, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and he came in before them. You can mark it in your Bibles right here. From this point on, Saul will never be the same man or the same king ever again. As disturbing as this is that the Spirit has left him, what's maybe even more disturbing to some of you is what we find in the rest of verse 14, what is said there. Because as God's spirit left, we're told an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit from the Lord. Now, without diving too deep and chasing rabbits this morning, without diving too deep into this subject, a basic understanding of what's happening here is that God has just permitted this demonic spirit to torment Saul. Yes, even demons and Satan himself must subject to the authority of God and God uses even them to accomplish his plan and his purposes. And this ought not to disturb anybody who's a believer, but rather it ought to instill courage within us because it shows us once again of God's sovereign power over all of his creation. Even those of the spiritual realm who have rebelled against him, even they must submit to the authority of God and he uses them. And there are a few occasions throughout Scripture where we actually are privileged to be able to see this take place. Judges 9.23, there's an incident there where an evil spirit, we're told, was sent from God to cause a rift between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. The book of Job, especially chapters 1 and 2, but the whole book of Job where we see Satan being used by God's permission to test Job's integrity and his faithfulness to God. 1 Kings 22 You read that there, and you discover that there's an angel. There's a gathering of angels, and and God needs a volunteer. And one of the angels lifts up, and he volunteers. And he says that he is volunteering to be a, a lying spirit in the mouth of all of Ahab's prophets in order to give them false prophecies. And God sent that angel to give them false prophecy. And then in the New Testament... We have several instances where we see the working of demons amongst various number of people where, where they have maladies and they have uh, diseases cast upon them because of the demonics, uh, the demonic um, uh, presence in their life, which shows us, uh, it kind of supports this whole idea that this demon is coming upon, David, or upon Saul and it's going to trouble him. Maladies and diseases could be the side effect of a demon we see. Jesus said that Satan is going to be allowed to to sift Peter. Also, God allows the Apostle Paul to have a thorn in the flesh. And, of course, the way that he describes that thorn in the flesh, he says, "It's it's the messenger of Satan to buffet me. All these are examples where God uses the spiritual world, even those who are not necessarily angels, but fallen angels, to accomplish his purposes. But what we have here in our text is God's judgment on a disobedient heart. Have you ever wondered that maybe, perhaps, God still judges people today in a similar manner because of disobedience they have in their heart towards Him? I, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, every malady and every disease and every, you know, kind of out of the, 
out of, the, out of nowhere um, sickness that comes upon people or that plagues them or anxieties or stress, or whatever it is. I'm not going to say that it's all demonic, but I will say this. I think it's more demonic. There are more that are demonic than we give credit for. This goes back to the fact that maybe it's a disobedient heart or maybe it's just a negligent heart that doesn't protect their life from such influence. This is God's judgment on Saul's disobedience. But again, I want you to know on the flip side of that, it's also, at the same time, God using, using it to bring David into Saul's life, into the public's eye. And ultimately, he uses this to bring David to the throne of Israel. God's using all things to work out his plan. We're told that this evil spirit troubled Saul. That word trouble just simply means to fear, to make afraid, to terrify, to trouble. We're going to see in the weeks to come as we study through the life of David how at times Saul will become completely paranoid. He will become uh, completely anxious, overcome and, uh, with unexplainable fears and anxieties and terror for no apparent reason. And it's all a result of this evil spirit troubling him. And again, I don't want to jump off on a tangent and chase after things, but I will say this. He's not possessing Saul. He's oppressing Saul. And there's a difference. I don't believe those who are God's people can be, oppressed, or can be uh, possessed by demons because, well, we were possessed by the Spirit of God. Amen? But we can't be oppressed by them. We can't be influenced by them. David gets a first-hand look here. He gets a first-hand look at how this all goes down in, David, in Saul's life. He's there whenever the demon comes up on him. And he's also there when he sees the demon leave through his plane. He sees this firsthand. He knows what it's like to have the Spirit of God depart from someone. And he knows the consequences of it. In fact, it appears that this is one of David's greatest fears. When he writes Psalm 51, which, by the way, for those of you who, who are in the know, Psalm 51 was written after his sin, his adultery that he had committed with, with Bathsheba, and then his attempt to cover it up by the murder of her husband out on the field of, of battle. And it's there that he writes Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, verse 10 and 11, listen to what he writes. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Now catch this. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Listen, David was fearful that the thing that had happened to Saul was going to happen to him. And by the way, he deserved it. And he knew he deserved it. Read Psalm 51. He knows he deserves it. But he's begging God, don't do to me what you did to Saul. Instead, he cast himself upon God's tender mercies and he pled for grace from God. And God bestowed it upon him. But David knew what it was like. He saw it firsthand what would happen in the Old Testament whenever the Spirit of God was taken from a man's life. David was fearful of it. You know, God used that to teach David a few things that he was going to need going forward. This is a theme that we see within this whole remainder of this chapter. In our text, because of the influence of this evil spirit on Saul, his servants, even his servants recognize that this problem isn't natural. Even his servants recognize that, that it's demonic. And so they offer a remedy. Which, by the way, one commentator said this is just a, a band-aid. It's not an actual fix. What he needed was a heart surgery. He needed to repent and turn from his sin. But Saul doesn't do that. But they offer this remedy of a band-aid. And by the way, God uses even the band-aid to accomplish his will. They suggest that Saul get someone who could play music to, to calm him, to calm his fears, to calm his worries, his stress, his anxieties, in essence, to, to ease his trouble. Now, it's a fact, and it's been proven, that there are positive benefits that come from music therapy. We know that. The right kind of music can have a positive effect on your mind, on your heart, on your health. But you know, it's also true that it can have a positive effect on, in your spirit. There are spiritual benefits to music. And not only, is there, uh, the, not only does the right kind of music have a positive effect on these things, but at the same time, the wrong kind of music can have a negative effect on you. There is a link between music 
and the spiritual. We need only to look around the world at the various religions of the world and look at how they apply music and how they use music in their pagan activities and their, their worship of their, of their gods, from the barbaric witchcraft that's found in the indigenous jungles but all the way to the sophisticated, mind-numbing repetition of some mega-religious movements today. What they're doing is they are just basically using music, they're utilizing music to manipulate their worshipers rather than using the music to offer worship to the only one who's worthy of music. But there is a relationship between the two. And at the chance of sounding legalistic this morning, and some people who will roll their eyes at me even right now, I will say this much. We need to be very careful about the kind of music that we yield ourselves to. Going back to the test of 1 Corinthians 10, 23 that we talked about last Sunday, all things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. There is a music that does not edify the believer, but instead has an adverse effect upon their soul and their communion with the Holy Ghost. Simply put, some music invokes the wrong kinds of spirits in our lives. It can grieve the Holy Spirit of God in us. And so you can just take it or leave it, all right? Just like the old song used to say, though, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Enough about that, right? After a servant's suggestion to get this heart player or somebody to play this instrument, Saul says, yeah, get me such a man as that. And it just so happened that one of his servants said, I already know the perfect man for the job, king. I already know one. You know, Jesse's son, the youngest one, you know, that one who's always out in the field with the sheep, he's your man. He's the guy. And look at the description that this servant gives of David in verse 18, in the second half of verse 18. It says, Behold, I have, seen a, uh, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning in playing, and a, valiant, a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Friends, that is quite a resume, is it not? He's just asking for someone who can play a harp. And look at what is offered to him. Now, first of all, he meets the main requirements laid down, right? He is cunning in playing. That's the main requirement. David is a skilled musician. But I want you to understand that, that he didn't just wake up one day and have this ability to play a harp. Evidently, David made good use of all those hours that he had spent out there in the fields with those sheep. Spending his spare time, not wasting it, not laying around, not saying, well, all the sheep look safe and healthy. I think I'll just take a nap. I'll just go play around over here. I'll get on my cell phone and play some little, you know, well, he didn't have social media, but you know how it is. Spare time. He didn't waste his spare time. Instead, he spent it practicing on this heart. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 reminds us, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. We don't do anything lackadaisically half-hearted. Everything should be done with our might. David spent his spare time practicing on his harp, and he was writing psalms and praises unto the Lord. I can imagine him sitting under the stars at night on one of those clear, uh, clear night skies. He sees one of those clear night skies, and he's got the sheep. They're all laid down. They're all at rest, and he looks up at the stars, and he writes something like, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast obeyed, what is man that thou art mindful of him? While watching over those sheep and caring for them and leading them and providing for them and protecting him, he's reminded of his own relationship with God. And he writes the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And evidently, maybe unbeknownst to David, there were people who were passing by and they could hear David singing. They could hear David out there on his harp. They saw him out there faithfully. And his reputation became known. That, that guy can sing and that guy can write some songs unto God. Well, boy, what a talented boy that shepherd boy is. Which, by the way, that's a reminder. You never know who's watching, but someone's always watching. Even in your spare time, be careful what you do with your spare time. Someone's always watching you. Maybe it wasn't public knowledge, but I know this much. This servant knew about David. 
he knew. Secondly, we see the servant that said that David was a mighty, valiant man and a man of war. Which basically, you put that together, it's saying he was courageous. And he was dangerous. He was courageous and he was able to kill, able to defend with force. Listen, he was just a calm shepherd boy, the sweet psalmist of Israel. But let me tell you, David could be violent if that's what it called for. And that's what this description is. Maybe some of you are wondering, what, well, how does this servant know that about David? I mean, after all, isn't he just a teenage boy at this time? Isn't he still out there in the, shep- in the sheep folds with, with his dad's sheep out there? Uh, he, David and Goliath doesn't have until the next chapter, right? How do they know this about David? We don't know exactly for sure if this is how it happened, but perhaps word gotten out that David has stood up to both a lion and a bear, and he has slain them with his own hand whenever they came amongst the flock of his father's sheep. And he defended those sheep, and he showed that he was mighty and courageous and strong. While David was out defending his father's sheep, he would oftentimes have to defend them from predators. He was, able to, he was well able to wield his staff and use it as a weapon. He spent countless hours in that field, no doubt, hurling stones with pinpoint accuracy as he was practicing with that sling in his spare time. And who knows, this fits the time period anyway. Who knows, maybe there were some times or a time or two where he had to get up and he had to defend the sheep and ward off some Philistine raiders who were trying to kill some of his dad's sheep. Maybe tales had gotten out about that. I don't know, but I do know this. He had this reputation. You don't go and mess around with Jesse's sheep because David's on watch there. He's a mighty courageous man, a valiant man, a man of war. The next thing we see here, he's described that he's prudent in matters, which just simply refers to his words. It refers to the fact that, that he, was, he was not just eloquent in words, but he was wise with his speech. He measured his words. And when he spoke, it revealed that he had understanding. David was also described here as a comely person. A comeliness refers to a shape or a form. If you look it up, that's, that's the base of it. So it's talking about basically his build. Now, we know that he wasn't big and tall or anything to look at compared to his older brothers, but he wasn't a wimp either. He had this comeliness that attracted others. He was no slouch. David wasn't lazy at what he did. David, he worked hard, and God uses uses even that to make him strong and to stand out amongst many other people. This is one of the things about his reputation and his resume that's given here. But then the final thing that the servant of David described David as, and it's probably the most important thing that, that, that David had going for him, and that is the fact that he said, the Lord is with him. It was obvious to this servant that God's blessings and God's presence was in David's life. He probably heard it in the way that he talked and the things that he spoke about, in the way that he conducted himself. And in the way that God was blessing him in his life, it's like everything that he did, God was there blessing it and working it. He could easily see that the Lord was with David. Listen, you put all that together, church, and that is the perfect resume, catch it, for this position that has just been made in Solomon's, or in Saul's court. It's the perfect resume for the position. David had no idea that his resume was even being put together at this time. All those boring hours out in the fields didn't seem to amount to much at the time. But what David didn't realize is that they were going to play a pivotal role in God's plan for his future. Those times where he thought, boy, it's just, you know, it's just leisure time. I'm I'm all the works. I'm just going to do nothing. I'm just going to lay around. No, 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 no. He was busy doing something. And God was preparing him even there in the sheepfold for what God had in store for him. He didn't realize it in the moment. But God was helping him build his resume for this position. And ultimately, this is the first step to him getting to the throne. Dr. Scott Polly said this, There would be no extraordinary days like David and Goliath without the ordinary days of David with the sheep. I don't know if you've learned this or not, but most of your life and most of my life consists of the ordinary days. And therefore, it's vitally important that we make the most 
of the ordinary days. Everything, even the mundane things that David was going through and that he, whenever he was working, it all worked to serve a greater purpose. And let me just tell you, Christian, the same is true for you and me. Even in the things that we don't think is so significant in those times and in those places and in those minor roles or whatever it is, and we think, well, you know, I'm just going to, I guess I'll just do this thing. Listen, even that is significant for what God has in store for us in the future. God wastes nothing. God is consistently at work. God never ceases working. He's consistently working and doing a work, preparing his people, giving us sufficient experience to, in order to fill out our life resumes for the future roles and the future plans that he has in store for us. And at that time, David had no idea that God was at work with him while he's sitting out there with those sheep. He didn't know all that God was getting him ready for in those, in those private moments, of just him and the sheep doing nothing else. Proverbs 16.1 says, The preparation of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Even right now, God is doing a work. He's preparing your hearts and he's preparing you in your life for something that he has in store. I'm telling you that right now, believing or trusting that you are a born-again child of God. He's preparing your hearts. Down in verse 9, Solomon, as if he's following up that thought in verse 1, he says, A man's heart deviseth his ways, but the Lord directeth his steps. So here he is, he's preparing your heart so that later on, he's going to direct your steps towards where you need to be. Based off his resume, Saul sins for David. And then he comes and he serves under him. He serves as his personal servant. He serves as his little minister of music so that every time that this demon came upon, uh, came upon Saul and troubled him, so David was called on and he would play his harp. And he would see the effects that this demon had upon the king. But here's the thing, David. David was already anointed to be the next king. He knew he was going to be the next king. And yet he comes and he serves under this lowly position of the present king under a man who quite honestly isn't fit for the office he isn't fit to be king i mean for crying out loud he's demonically influenced but david doesn't ever say no saul you, you need to be the one serving me don't you understand i'm going to be the next king of israel the spirit of god is upon me he's not upon you anymore saul david comes in instead and he does exactly what his king requires him to do by the way, this is just another picture of Jesus Christ in the life of David. A king who is anointed but not yet sitting on his throne, and yet he's serving as a servant. You know, it is never recorded once in Scripture. Not one time do we see David coming to Saul, letting him know, uh, by the way, I'm the one who's anointed, not you. I'm the one the Spirit's upon, not you. He never ever relays to Saul. Now, Saul figures it out later, but David never tells him, the Spirit's chosen me to be the next king and has rejected you. Not one time does David say that. Instead, he serves faithfully for years. Even when his service was unappreciated. Even when his service was lied about and misconstrued and painted as if he was in rebellion against the king, David continued to serve that king he humbled himself. Serves him faithfully for years. You know, that most scholars believe he was between the ages of 15 and 18 whenever Samuel anointed him in, 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 earlier uh, in this chapter. But it's not going to be until he's 30 that David finally sits upon the throne as king. Colossians 3.23 tells us, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. See, David served Saul. Every time he grabbed that harp, he did it heartily. He did it with all his heart. And he did it unto the Lord. He must have understood early on, he must have learned this lesson, that promotion comes from the Lord. Promotion comes from the Lord. David's taken out of the sheepfold and he's put into Saul's court. 
You know, David didn't apply for that job. God moved him into that position. And just think about the education that he's receiving there in the court. He is seeing a live example of how it was done, how a king was to sit upon the throne and to rule and reign over the nation. He learned not only from Saul's successes, but he also learned from his mistakes. First hand, he had a front row seat to it. And God was using this time, just like out in the sheepfold, he was using this time in Saul's court to teach David important lessons that he was going to need to know whenever he was sitting upon the throne. God doesn't waste any moments in our lives. There are no pauses, no blank spaces. God is always working in his children's lives. But here's David. He's taken out of the sheepfold. He's put into Saul's court. We read eventually he, he's made Saul's armor bearer. The next thing you know, we're going to see is he's going to be made a, a giant slayer and a national hero. Then he's going to be made a son-in-law unto the king. And eventually he'll be made king. Listen, at that time, David wasn't looking to become the king of Israel. He wasn't applying for the jobs. He was just looking to be the best version of whatever it is that God had made him in the moment. And that is the greatest thing we can learn from this passage. Where we are right now, be the greatest version of what God has made us. And trust that he's going to move us where he wants us tomorrow. Whether it was a shepherd, whether it was a personal servant, whether it was a soldier, or whether it was a king, David was just trying to be the best at whatever it was that God had made him in that moment. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning who needs to hear this message, but learn from the example of David. Trust that God is going to make you what he is calling you to be. He will do it. Rest in his sovereign power. Rest in his, his sovereign plan for your future, your life. Know that even right now, he's presently working in you right where you are. He's not waiting for you to get to the next stage for him to work in you. No, he's working right where you are, even right now. Regardless of what rung of the ladder that you're on, or if you've even touched the ladder, God's working in you. You've got to trust this and know this. He's placed you right where you are. If you are following the Spirit of God, then you're right where he wants you. You're in the role that he's put you in, in the situation that you're currently facing. And my encouragement is just simply this, faithfully strive to be the best version of whatever it is that God has made you right now, in the present. Again, if you are in the center of his will, if you are following the leadership that the Spirit of God who dwells within you is, is giving to you, he has you right where he wants you, and he will use this time to prepare you for what he has in store, what he has in store for your future. But I will forewarn you, it may be like David, it may be years from now before that ever surfaces. Just be faithful. Faithful in the ordinary. Faithful in the moment. Use the waiting time profitably. Use and learn and grow through your current circumstances, whatever they may be. And continue to let God build your spiritual resume for the next venture because he's at work in you, Christian. He's getting you ready for something. If not for something here in this life, then we know this for a certainty. He's, he's preparing us and getting us ready for eternity. Don't rush where you are in the moment. Make good use of your time. He's using it to equip you for what's next. And when you look back, you'll probably see how God has used it all to bring you to the point where he wants you. And you'll see that it was not all in vain. And God had a purpose all along. My encouragement is, just trust him. Just trust him. He's preparing you for his plan, for his purposes.